Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 159 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Although my own work and much of this podcast has focused on the European Middle Ages, of course there was a whole wide world out there, interconnected and innovative, with people pushing cultural and geographical boundaries and the limits of human endurance. It's always a pleasure to learn more about the medieval world, so I'm very happy to bring you an episode that pushes this podcast's horizons on the people who were some of the very best on the planet at chasing the horizon. This week, I spoke with Dr. James Flexner about Oceania in the Middle Ages. James is a senior lecturer in historical archaeology and heritage in the Department of Archaeology at the University of Sydney, where he focuses on landscape and historical archaeology. He's the co-editor of two books, including Community-Led Research, Walking New Pathways Together. And he's the author of An Archaeology of Early Christianity in Vanuatu, Custom and Religious Change on Tana and Aromango, 1839-1920. His new element in the Global Middle Ages series is Oceania, 800-1800 CE, a millennium of interactions in a sea of islands. Our conversation on how, why, and just how far Oceanic peoples explored, as well as the ways in which we can learn about the rich history of this region, is coming up right after this. Well, thank you, James, for coming on to talk to us about Oceania. I'm really excited about this, so thanks for coming on. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Okay, so for people who don't know, when we're talking about Oceania, what are we talking about? Where geographically are we talking about? So the region of Oceania covers roughly one third of the Earth's surface. And one of my favorite descriptions of it is from a historian called Greg Denning, who defines Oceania according to the migratory pathway of the yala or mutton bird, which starts in the area of what is today sort of southeastern Australia, goes north through sort of Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands, all the way up to the Bering Sea, back down around via the Tuamotu Islands and what's today French Polynesia, returning via Aotearoa New Zealand. It's a migratory journey that covers about 25,000 kilometers, which is an annual migration that these birds do. And the region of islands and sea inside of that migratory circle covers approximately what most scholars refer to when they talk about Oceania. It's huge. It's huge. I mean, a couple of years ago, I was writing just like a short history of medieval Europe and that continent felt huge. So like, <laughs> this is massive geographical space. Yeah. So for comparison, one of the groups of islands where I work, which is the Mongareva Islands in, in French Polynesia, the distance between Tahiti, which is where the capital of French Polynesia is located in Mongareva, is similar to the distance between Paris and Sofia in Bulgaria. And that's a tiny sliver of the vastness of Oceania, and that should give people who are more familiar with European geography kind of a sense of the area we're talking about. <laughs> it's massive. And when you think about exploring over that distance, it's just mind boggling. So I'm, I'm very excited to be talking about this today. So your element for this Cambridge series that you've done it covers 800 to 1800. So why did you pick this space of dates? Part of it had to do with fitting into that idea of, you know, the time frame of the Middle Ages that's used in other parts of the world, but also kind of stretching it a little bit. So I spoke to Geraldine Hang and Susan Noakes, who are the series editors about this, and, and they were talking about the idea that a lot of medievalists will cut the European Middle Ages off at 1492 around the time of the Reconquista in Spain and, and Columbus sailing across the Atlantic. It doesn't make sense to cut things off in that space in Oceania because of a variety of kind of historical reasons. And I guess as an example, if you look at somewhere like Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands, their first encounters with Europeans don't occur until Cook in 1778, 1779 CE. And so that period over the course of the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s is actually a really important period in Hawaiian history, particularly in terms of the emergence of these kind of competing polities that have been kind of compared to small feudal kingdoms 
And so if you cut things off at 1500, you lose a lot of the sort of dynamism that occurs in that kind of Polynesian historical space. On the other side of it, the sort of 800 CE beginning coincides with one of the great pulses of Polynesian navigation and colonization of new lands, moving out of the so-called Polynesian homeland or Hawaii in what's today kind of the area of Tonga and Samoa, and then moving both east into central Polynesia. So thinking about places like the Cook Islands or Tahiti, but also potentially a certain amount of movement towards the west into already settled lands. I think that makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that I liked about your, I'm going to call it an element instead of a book, but we know it's a kind of a short book. One of the things that you mentioned is when people were starting to come up with eras and they're talking about Bronze Age, Iron Age, they tend to put people in Oceania kind of back, like they're in prehistory mm. type stuff. And that's a function of choosing this technology as a way of deciding who's who on the scale. Whereas if you look at navigation and seafaring technology, it's totally different, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's a that European habit of kind of seeing a contemporary culture and trying to project it backwards into some period of quotes prehistory and Polynesian people at the time of European encounters beginning as early as 1579 with Magellan going onward through the late 1700s and into the 1800s. They did use groundstone tools like adzes and axes. Some but not all of the people in the region made pottery. They tended to mostly practice some form of horticulture or agriculture. But as you say, the, the story is a lot more complicated than that. And the kinds of maritime technology that people had, their navigational capabilities, as well as I, I would argue their kind of landscape management techniques were actually really technologically sophisticated. But it wasn't something that was necessarily visible to 19th century Victorian Europeans who started to kind of carve up these spaces and, and really use a, a very kind of imperialist sort of logic to say, oh, you know, these less advanced people over here need to be civilized in one way or the other. In the contemporary world, we don't really see that. Or we, we like to think we don't see things that way anymore. But at the time, it sort of fit a particular kind of colonial logic that I think a lot of scholars of Oceania have been trying to work against for quite a long time. Well, importantly, <laughs> I mean, mm. it's important work to work back against that. Okay, so I do want to talk about landscape management because I think that's really important as something that happens as these voyages go on. So let's start talking about the voyages. So people start heading east from Tonga and Samoa and they're looking for what? What are they doing? How are they heading out? There are a few things to keep in mind when we're talking about oceanic voyaging. One is that these were systematic and intentional voyages. So computer simulations that people have been running since the 1980s actually have shown that there's no way that all of the islands in Oceania end up inhabited if people were just randomly voyaging in any given direction or they were getting blown off course and stumbling ac across something by pure luck. The number of ships it would have taken to actually do that, it kind of results in an impossible model of, <laughs> of what people might have been doing. So people were clearly going out and intentionally seeking out these new lands and one of the things that several people, including Patrick Kirch, who is my PhD supervisor at Berkeley, have proposed is there's something in the nature of particularly chiefly kinship structures that probably encourage this kind of voyaging, where if you were a junior son from a high-ranking chiefly lineage, you would expect your older brother, your oldest brother, your older brothers to inherit most of the lands and the titles and the family's wealth. So if you had ambitions for yourself, one way that you could achieve a certain standing within your society was through these kind of great voyaging feats, where if you could go off, find a new island, an uninhabited island, come back and say, hey, I've found this new island. Who wants to come with me? 
you then become the founding and paramount lineage on the, the new territory that you settle. And so that's probably one of the factors that drives some of this. There, I think, also is an aspect of these societies that they are voyaging societies. They're societies where some of it is about prestige, but some of it is also about, I would say, exploration and curiosity. You know, it's people wanting to know what's out there, what's over the horizon. And one of the things that is part of the nature of Pacific Ocean geography is as you go from west to east, the islands tend to get smaller and they tend to get further apart. What that means is over the long period of sea voyaging in the region, which actually dates as far back as the last ice age, people have these kind of what have sometimes been called nurseries where you get good at voyaging back and forth to the limits of the technology that you have. And then over time, there's some kind of new sorts of technologies that enter, whether it's new kinds of sailing technologies or new kinds of navigational techniques, new ways of outfitting watercraft for these long voyages, new environmental understandings of currents and winds and things like that, that eventually push people to go, okay, well, what, you know, how can we get the next island over the horizon? And, and one of the really fascinating things I often think about is in certain accounts from Polynesian master navigators, the perspective is not that you are in a watercraft moving across the ocean with a bunch of stable islands. It is that the fixed point is the kind of island and what you're doing is you're actually pulling the ship that you're sailing, the, the double hull voyaging canoe that you're sailing to the island that's the destination, even if it's something that you don't know is there, right? You're just sort of guessing that if there's an island there, it will pull us to it. And then we can sort of eventually find our way back and get enough of a mass of sort of people and crops and animals to go and, and settle the place long term. <laughs> that's a good way of thinking about it. I think it would give you some confidence if you're not sure where you're going, just having this sense that it's going to pull me to it. I'm going to get there <laughs> eventually. Yeah. And if you don't find anything, one of the things that people begin exploiting in this sort of period around 800, 900 CE is the seasonal wind shift in the tropical Pacific, where at certain times of year, the dominant winds in most of the region coming from the east, right? So blowing kind of against will shift to a westerly wind. And so what that does is if you get in a voyaging canoe while the westerly wind is the dominant current, that gives you a huge tailwind to sail along to a point. And if you don't find anything seasonally, the wind's going to shift back and push you back. And if you have a good sense of dead reckoning where you know where you are, at least in terms of what latitude your ship is sitting on, then you just get another push back and you can return relatively safely to your home island. That makes a lot of sense. I know that this is an oral tradition for the most part. So sometimes you have to piece things together just from oral tradition, from the little bit of archaeology that we can find. Do you have a sense of, do they pack for this eventuality or do they imagine that there might be something, a place they can stop by? Or you think that they plan for, we might be out there for months. Let's pack a whole lot of food. Mm. So a double hulled ocean voyaging craft, which to give people a sense of what we're talking about, we're talking about a ship that's at least the hulls that are shaped like canoes are at least sort of 20 meters long and they are attached by a large platform made of wood and thatch and rope and other materials that has a house structure on it in addition to the the sailing rig and on a voyage that intended colonization of new lands you would bring with you all of the crops that you needed you would bring the domesticated animals. So this would be pigs, dogs, chickens. You'd have some commensal animals like rats and certain kinds of lizards, some of which were accidental and some of which have been argued to be kind of semi-intentional with rats serving as a, a kind of, quote, starvation food. The idea is you're carrying with you everything you need to set up your society when you arrive on a previously uninhabited island. 
So it's been called a, quote, portmanteau biota. That is to say a transported landscape of plants and animals that provides all of the resources you need to build a civilization in a, a new environment. People would carry that stuff with them as a way of being ready to get to the new lands and set themselves up. Now, of course, it takes a little while to get your crops up and running and productive and producing enough to sustain people. And one of the things that is a common pattern across Oceania is when people do arrive in new areas, they often have a period of a few decades or a few generations where they're more reliant on things like marine resources and seabirds which tend to get somewhat overexploited as people are kind of adapting and waiting to get their agricultural systems running, which can have sometimes unintended knock-on effects where, for example, overexploitation of seabirds results in a reduction in soil fertility because the kind of input of nutrients like phosphorus, which is in bird poop for lack of a better term, um, <laughs> that if you if you take out too many of the seabirds from that environment, you take out some of that nutrient input, and that can cause problems down the line. And, and so part of the story of Polynesian colonization is really about environmental learning and people adapting to slightly different environments. Because even though we're talking about mostly an area of tropical islands, they're all going to be a little bit different in terms of everything from the age of the soils to the amount of rainfall they get to how much of a rain shadow effect the mountains have. And these factors are all things that people have to kind of adapt to using this common suite of crops and other environmental management techniques that they're using to, to try to figure out how to live in different parts of the world. Yeah, I think that's so fascinating where they're like, okay, we're going to pick this kit. <laughs> we're going to pack the kit. It's going to have all the things we need in it. We're going to go there. We're going to set things up like we've done a million times before. And it's just, it's so human and optimistic. I love this idea, like setting yourself the challenge that you're going to try and set up a new colony on a new, entirely new, undiscovered island. <laughs> so what were some of the crops that were the staple crops that they pretty much always packed in their kit when they brought things to a new island? The main staples in the oceanic diet in terms of plant foods are tubers, specifically taro, which is probably originally domesticated in Southeast Asia, yams, which were originally domesticated, at least the oceanic suite of yams. Yams are a bit complicated because it gets domesticated separately in a bunch of different places, but there is definite evidence that by about 5,000 years ago, there's an independent domestication of yams in the highlands of New Guinea. And then these are complemented by a variety of fruit and vegetable crops that include things like sugarcane, breadfruit, bananas of various descriptions, which is another New Guinea domesticate originally and then all kinds of different greens and fruits and things like that. Those were the main things that people were carrying with them. Eventually, they add to this kumala or sweet potato, which is picked up on the west coast of South America, which is another fascinating part of the story. We know that at some point, we don't know exactly when, but sometime between 1000 and certainly no later than about 1400 CE, people reach the west coast of South America, Polynesian navigators pick up this sweet potato and go, hmm, this is a useful crop. <laughs> Unlike the more tropically adapted yams and taro and subtropical, sweet potato is actually a frost adapted crop because it was originally domesticated in the Andes Mountains in South America. And sweet potato very quickly swings back the other way through Oceania and becomes really critical to New Zealand or Aotearoa Maori agriculture, because New Zealand is so much further south than the rest of the islands in Polynesia, a lot of the crops really only grow in the northern part of the North Island. So as people move further south, they're figuring out how to live in these landscapes that freeze, which is a killer for taro or yams. Sweet potato actually can survive there. And so that becomes the main starchy staple, which is another part of that story of 
not only adaptation, but exchange and contacts with different cultures. And, you know, you can imagine voyaging people whose entire world is kind of 99.9% .9 ocean. And suddenly they reach this west coast of South America and there's these ginormous mountains and <laughs> this sort of coast runs as far as you can go north or south. And they probably just thought, well, this is interesting, but it's not really for us and turned around <laughs> and came back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's nothing to discover on our boats around here. So let's head back. But there's some speculation that perhaps they brought chickens to, <laughs> to South America, right? Yes, there is. To my mind, and I, I will say I'm not a, a geneticist by training, but my colleague Alice Story's research looking at the genetics of chicken introduction and kind of the timing of that in South America, it's, it seems reasonably convincing that there was a pre-Spanish introduction of chicken from Polynesians to South American people. And, and it makes sense in a way, right? There's a sort of nice reciprocal exchange story there. Of, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you have something we want, we have something you want. This is something we can both agree is a, a, a useful thing for both of us. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to find out more about that as that develops. I think it's a story that is interesting and be nice to find out more about it as as we learn more. But that brings me to trade. So once people have found these islands, they've built a colony, they're going to stay there for a bit. There's trade back and forth between nations and islands and stuff, right? So what are people trading at this time? Oceanic trade networks are basically as complex as one can imagine them to be. The most famous one, arguably, from the region, which has been kind of well documented since the really the beginnings of 20th century modern anthropology, is the Kula Ring from the Trobriand Islands and the surrounding islands in Papua New Guinea. And what's really interesting, you know, when we talk about trade in Oceania, Yes, we were talking about the movement of objects or materials or trade goods, but it's really about the ways that these things, these objects tie into society and they tie into personhood. So in the Kula Ring, for example, which very famously in one direction, you have this sort of cycle of shell armbands and in the other direction, a, a particular kind of shell necklace, uh, among other objects that people are exchanging. These objects have names and they have stories attached to them, right? And the stories are attached to all of the people who they've belonged to over the, the years and generations and the accomplishments of those people. And it's actually that sort of attachment to people that gives these things their value rather than necessarily any physical properties. Because a lot of these things look very similar in terms of kind of shape and size. So it's it's kind of different to how we imagine long distance trade and exchange being about particular kind of gold or spices or certain kinds of, of materials where they're valued for what they are. In Oceania, they're valued partly for what they are, but more so for their social lives and their social connections. And the range of long distance material exchanges varied immensely across the region and covered everything from utilitarian things like woven mats or stone adzes, all the way to really kind of monumental exchanges of objects like the Rao or stone money from Micronesia. And Scott Fitzpatrick's research has documented the ways that people were sailing hundreds of kilometers between Yap and Palau to extract these giant discs of stone from particular cave sites and then sail. And these things are, they can be many, many meters high. They can weigh hundreds of tons. And, and so these are very heavy, massive <laughs> objects that people are carrying around on their sailing canoes. But even in that case, it's about the stories and it's about the places that the objects are attached to. And actually their value comes from the knowledge that the people who who sailed to collect these things needed to have in order both to reach the islands where they were going, but also to know where are the appropriate places to extract this material to bring back as a way of building wealth and building prestige in their societies. That's a really interesting point about these objects having a social significance, because doesn't that imply that 
people on one island must know some stories that would make an object significant from the other culture that they're getting from the other culture, right? So does this mean that there is quite a lot of circulation of stories and social news from other islands that would make that important to them? There can be. Again, it's really hard to tell a one-size-fits-all story for <laughs> Oceania because the region is so variable. As an example, in the Hawaiian chronicles, or Mo'olelo, there are these stories early on of regular voyages between Tahiti and Hawaii. So you have people like Pa'au or Mo'ikeha, who are named navigators who do these kind of epic voyages back and forth. And there's all kinds of drama and politics and, you know, Game of Thrones type stuff <laughs> happening in these stories. That's really fascinating. But what's wild about the kind of Hawaiian story is sometime around 1400 CE, those voyages stop. And the Hawaiian islands then develop independently in isolation from the rest of Polynesia over a period of, of nearly 400 years until suddenly Cook shows up over the horizon and, and they're drawn back into the outside world. And there's obviously debates about the reasons why that happened. But the fact that it did happen shows that some of these places at various points in their histories for political, social, or religious reasons stopped doing those kinds of voyaging and navigation. In the Western Pacific, it's almost the opposite. If anything, during the last 500 to 1,000 years, the story of those islands is an intensification of these networks and of voyaging and of exchanges back and forth and of a kind of proliferation of different kinds of trade goods, whether it's things like pottery, or particular forms of pendants in shell or stone, which are obviously things that we can potentially document archaeologically, or things that we know ethnographically were exchanged, like feather money or particular forms of mats or baskets that were valued in, in certain ways that we can sort of assume people have been doing for at least a couple of hundred years, if not maybe a thousand years or more. And so it, it does, it really depends, but there is there is no part of island life that doesn't involve a certain amount of exchange. So even going back to Hawaii, my colleagues, Peter Mills and the people who he works with have documented these ads exchanges and exchanges of volcanic glass materials going back and forth within the Hawaiian islands. So even there, there is this story of, of maritime trade and exchange and networking and Obviously, it's never just objects, right? It's also information and it's stories and it's gossip and it's all the other <laughs> things that, you know, are just part of human social life. Yeah, exactly. People stories, which brings me to the challenge, which is as a historian, how do you find out these stories? So do you find yourself talking to elders to find this stuff out or are you looking at stuff that was written down kind of closer to our time? Where do you find the stories? Anywhere I can is the answer. <laughs> so I would probably identify more as a, a historical archaeologist than a historian. And my job, as I see it, is to use every potential source of information possible to understand the places where I'm working and the people who used to live there. So sometimes that involves looking through the chronicles of European navigators in the 1600s and 1700s. Sometimes it's reading late 19th century missionary accounts, or early 20th century ethnography, and kind of reading against the grain to try to unpick what is colonialist myth-making and what is actually telling us some profound truths about these societies and you get to know who the more sensitive and sympathetic observers are and, and who are the people who just want to cast people as a bunch of primitives or a bunch of cannibals or whatever they're trying to do for whatever political project they're working on. Oral traditions certainly play an extremely important role. What's kind of interesting in the history of Pacific archaeology is 
over the course of the 20th century and into the, the 21st, there's this kind of back and forth between late 19th and early 20th century anthropology, where people took, say, accounts of particular voyages as historically, quote, accurate, to towards the middle of the 20th century, more of a sense that these things were kind of myths that existed to maintain a particular kind of order within these societies to by the end of the 20th century and to where we are today, recognizing that a lot of these are kind of real histories with actual historical characters who existed. And even when there are magical or mythical elements to them, that they they contain these pieces of historical reality. And then, of course, the side that I always keep in mind is the material traces of what people did and using that as a major source of evidence to try to understand, say, how particular agricultural systems got established and when, or how people lived on the landscape, what kinds of material culture they used in their everyday lives, and how those things change through time. So to me, it's really about drawing on as many different kinds of evidence as as you can to create this kind of holistic picture of, of what people's lives were like. Yeah, I'm glad there is a shift to looking at these stories that involve loosely termed facts and myths, because this is very much similar to what we see in the European Middle Ages, where you have a battle, and we can show that this battle happened. But you know, there are things that are attributed to miracles, kind of in the same way, Mm. where it's, you could dismiss it as myth, perhaps if you zoomed out too far. And I think it's kind of analogous to these stories that have deities in them. You can't dismiss it as being just myth. It's just too similar. I think there's too much that is rich in there that tells you about history to dismiss it wholesale. So I'm glad that it's not happening as much anymore. Yeah. And I think it's about being sensitive to the lived realities of the people who experienced these things in the past, that they really did inhabit a universe that was inspirited and that didn't kind of draw this Cartesian boundary around what is, quote, real versus what lives in the realm of ghosts and ancestors and demigods and culture heroes. And for a lot of Pacific Islanders who are alive today, they still don't draw that those kinds of boundaries. So it's also about being sensitive to the indigenous communities that we work with in the islands and thinking about their reality. And for me, I think it's a really useful exercise to kind of do a certain amount of suspension of disbelief to really understand what these landscapes in Oceania can be if we are kind of attuned to including that sort of supernatural dimension, which is not to say that we should be appropriating the cosmologies of of oceanic peoples, Mm -hmm. but that we have to kind of take a lot of what they say about their worlds on its own terms and take it seriously as, as something that can shape the way that we talk about the past in this region. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's so important and something that you mentioned in the element. These are living cultures, right? So many times people talk about indigenous cultures as being something from the past when (laughs) indigenous people are still around and still living their culture. So I think it's important to keep that in mind that we can't just relegate the stuff to the past and we need to integrate our understanding of the past with the understanding of it in the present. The last thing that you mentioned in the book is thinking about it in terms of not history per se, as much as historicity. So what does that mean to you when you're working with this? The idea of oceanic historicities is something that my colleague Chris Ballard, it's a turn of phrase that he came up with to talk about all of the ways that history is present and lived and performed and can be experienced through these more than human and emplaced phenomena and basically trying to take history away from being just kind of a dry chronicle of first this happened and then another thing happened and then another thing happened, which I think is out of step with a lot of the actual experience of being in the islands and talking to people about their lives and their past and the kind of folding of space and time that's inherent to an oceanic worldview. 
and trying to come up with a Western academic terminology that's kind of respectful of that and sensitive to that, which I think is a, it's always a challenging thing, particularly for me as someone who doesn't come from that background and has had to sort of learn it as I go. I try to be very cognizant of this idea that I'm not I'm not trying to necessarily speak for or speak over people whose ancestors come from the region, but to try to find ways to maybe better translate the ways that people have explained to me how they understand their past to the kinds of academic audiences that often I'm speaking to in my own work. And I think there's one of those interesting coincidences that happened as my book was kind of impressed with Cambridge University, there's a New Zealand Maori woman called uh, Maddie Williams who wrote a book, which I would recommend reading as well, called Polynesia 900 to 1600, where she's tackling a lot of these same ideas, but obviously from much more of an insider perspective, being a Maori woman who, who was you know brought up in this universe. And so I, I definitely suggest that's a, a really good complimentary read for people who are looking for a bit more in this area. But it's doing a similar set of things in, in terms of trying to make the Polynesian past or the Oceanic past more legible for people who, when they think of the Middle Ages, tend to think of Europe as kind of the center of all of what's happening in the world at that time. Yes. <laughs> I think that's important, but I think you're right that it that has traditionally been the way that people of European ancestry have been looking at the world. And so I'm so happy that your work exists, that her work exists, and we'll definitely give people the link to that book as well. Thank you so much for coming on and introducing us to a new perspective on a new area for people who perhaps have always looked at the Middle Ages in terms of the borders of Europe. Thank you so much for introducing us to Oceania at this time. Thanks, James. Of course, it was my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me to come talk to you. To find out more about James's work, you can visit his faculty webpage at the University of Sydney at sydney.edu.au slash arts slash about slash our hyphen people slash academic hyphen staff slash James hyphen Flexner. His new element is Oceania, 800 to 1800 CE, a millennium of interactions in a sea of islands. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on this week, Peter? Hey, hey, well, we've got an article by you. <laughs> Yay. I know. <laughs> Hopefully our readers are not getting too tired of you. But, uh, the... <laughs> wow, thanks. The Combat of the Thirty, this famous mini battle that happens is in the 14th century. Yeah, it's a cool story. Yeah, so we've got that. We've got Ken Monshine talking about the 1988 film Willow. <laughs> I loved that movie back me, in the day. <laughs> me too, me too. Um, it's slightly medieval, right? It's <laughs> Well, it's fantasy. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So we have that. We have a piece on how women named their children in the Middle Ages. And I'm working on a piece on the jobs on a medieval manor, government jobs, right? Like if you were the steward, what did you do on a manor? Sounds good. Try my best. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you to all of Medievalist.net's patrons on Patreon.com for your support each month. Patrons can access all sorts of great stuff like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and Medieval World Magazine, formerly known as Medieval Warfare, as well as a book club and exclusive maps by Tina Ross. Your patronage directly funds this podcast, as well as Medievalist.net's other work, so thank you. To get in on all the action, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from oceans to potions, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sobalski, all over social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an amazing day. Mm -hmm.